According to news agency reports received at Lloyd's January 8, 1979, French motor tanker Betelgeuse, 61,766 tons gross, sustained two explosions while discharging cargo at Gulf Oil Ocean Terminal Bantry shortly before 0100 hours today. First explosion cut her in two, and second, more powerful, followed almost immediately after. Reported that her 42 crew feared dead, together with five Gulf Oil ship employees. On the information received, Smith Talk International Salvage Company, Rotterdam, goes into action. Smith Lloyd 107, Smith Lloyd 107. Goedemorgen. This is Smith Radio. Barracuda, 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 come to her. We just had a telephone call for the explosion of that tank. Will you leave time to slow down? Preparing the Barracuda. Good morning, Captain. We're putting on a lot of sort of equipment, and we expect her to sail within a couple of hours directly to Bantry Bay. Southwestern Island. The salvage vessel Barracuda proceeds at full speed for Bantry Bay, Ireland. Only the bow of the Betelgeuse is visible above the water. The salvage crew set out to make a first inspection of the stricken tanker. Crude oil covers the deck. Gas in the remaining tanks threatens another, more devastating explosion. Two-thirds of the ship have sunk in deep water next to the jetty. The forepart is inclined at an angle of 35 degrees. To keep the forepart in position and prevent damage to the jetty, a towing wire is rigged between the bow of the Betelgeuse and the Smith Lloyd 107, a powerful supply tug with a bollard pull of 100 tons. The obstructed jetty is the only berth for the tank farm. The wreck must be removed to clear the jetty. It is a monumental task, complicated by the totally unknown condition of the sunken part. Nothing on this scale has ever been tried before. If it succeeds, this will be the biggest wreck removal in history. Crude is leaking from the cargo tanks. Planes are brought in to spray dispersant to break down the oil and prevent it from polluting the shoreline. Oil booms, connected to fishing boats, gather large areas of slick and feed them into a skimming vessel. Divers examine the hull. The tactics of the operation will be based on the observations of these experts.
40 meters down, in total darkness, surrounded by the mournful groans of the torn hull, twisting in the tide. First underwater inspections show that the hull is not broken in two, but rather into three equal sections. The fore part seems to be separated from the midship. The aft part with the engine room has sunk by its own weight into 15 meters of mud. Taking advantage of the relatively calm weather, valves, hoses, high-pressure hydraulic lines, and special hydraulic cargo safety pumps are brought aboard. While the others are busy topside, the divers continue their inspection of the wreck. According to the information available, it seems very possible that the bow section is only lightly attached to the rest of the ship. Therefore, mobile pumps ballast the forepeak to adjust the trim. <laughs> the Smith Lloyd 107 will try to tow off the bow section. Everybody just left the bagel hoser. Everybody just left the bagel hoser so you can start the pulling out. You can start pulling out, Owen. Barracuda, Barracuda, Smith Lloyd 107, uh, Roger, everybody left by the version, so we'll just decrease power and uh, start pulling. Barracuda, Roger. Uh, Roger. 11,000 horsepower at work. The bow section is still entangled with the rest of the wreckage. Now one of the alternative plans is put into action. The remaining crude oil in the bow section must be discharged. 500 meters of open water separate the casualty from the tank farm on Whitty Island. Because the jetty's submarine pipelines cannot be used, a floating hose has to be rigged to pump the cargo to the oil terminal storage tanks. By pumping out the oil, the forepart is lightened, further pollution minimized, and 10,000 tons of cargo saved.
The naval architect and the salvage inspector work out the highly technical details of unloading the tanks. High pressure hydraulic lines to the safety pumps are connected up. The pumps have been specially designed to be inserted into ship's Butterworth holes. Very carefully, the pumps are lowered into place. Although inert gas is used, the danger of explosion is ever present. The hydraulic power packs are stationed aboard the Barracuda, standing at a safe distance off the tanker. The final connections are made, and pumping out the cargo begins. Pumping continues day and night until all the remaining cargo is safely ashore. Seawater is now pumped into the forepeak and ballast tanks to break the bow section free. Ashore, any movement of the ship is precisely monitored. We are able to detect here support and motion of about, well in this instance it looks about uh, like a foot to 18 inches. It's moving up and down vertically about 15 inches, but it's also moving fore and aft about a foot to 18 inches. Then, a serious development occurs. Bottom plating of the port side wing and center tank two ripped open as the bow section broke loose. Seawater rushed in and she developed a dangerous list to port. At this point, anything could happen. The worst being that the lightened bow section could flip over and lurch into the jetty. Proper action must be taken at once. Aboard the Barracuda, lids of ventilation pipes taken from the bow section are fitted with air hose couplings. The plan is to force compressed air into the tidal tanks to displace water and correct the list. The next morning, the bow section is under control and is boarded for final inspection. The first stage of this enormous operation has been successfully completed and Smittok proudly raises the flag. With the Barracuda alongside to keep a constant air pressure in the ripped hull, the 107 tows the bow section safely away. The midsection will be raised by using a combination of shear legs, compressed air, and polystyrene spheres. The compressed air and the shear legs will give a controlled lifting. Because the polystyrene floats, inside the wreck it packs tightly from the top downwards, thus forcing out the water and creating buoyancy. But that is still a long way off.
The crack, splitting the midsection from the aft part, will have to be completely cut through. Explosives are used to force apart the two remaining sections. Divers prepare to cut access openings for the polystyrene hoses and holes in the hull for the compressed air to escape during the raising. In Rotterdam, 200 tons of polystyrene is processed for the raisin. The raw material with a consistency of coarse sugar is expanded by steam to form billions of tiny air encasing spheres. These tiny objects will assist in lifting the midsection. The polystyrene is blown into a seagoing barge bound for Bantry Bay. At the same time, divers patch openings in the hull of the midsection prior to pumping in the polystyrene and air. It's a tricky job at up to 40 meters depth in poor visibility. The barge carrying the polystyrene is brought into position over the midship. Hoses are rigged for pumping the spheres. The pumping starts. The pumping continues for two weeks. Finally, the required buoyancy is achieved. To be sure that all of the entangled wreckage between the two sections has been cut through, it is decided to use a heavy anchor chain to saw through any remaining bottom plates. The shear legs tuck lift one will do the job.
brute force and a delicate touch combine to rip apart the obstructing steel. The tonnage indicator shows a rapid fall off in tension, which could mean success. Divers go down to check. The cut is clean. Now the chain is looped under the midsection to assist in the lifting. Air hoses are coupled. Compressed air is forced into the hull. The lifting of the midsection starts. After seven months on the bottom, the midsection floats. Everything has gone according to plan. Lift 1 must use all her lifting capacity during the tow to shallow water. The Barracuda rides alongside, continuously pumping in compressed air to maintain safe buoyancy. Because of the tanker's tremendous draft and dangerous condition, a submersible pontoon is brought in to lift and transport the midsection out of Bantry Bay. After three months of patching, Water is pumped out to raise the midsection as high as possible. It is discovered that a bottom plate is bent back like an open sardine can and hangs down 15 meters, making it necessary for the midsection to be loaded athwart ships on the pontoon. At night, the pontoon is submerged and the midsection towed over into position. The next morning, the enormous structure is securely in place and ready to go. So far, so good. Two down, one to go. But the next job will be more difficult than the two already accomplished combined. The aft weighing seven and a half thousand tons. At the Smittock office in Rotterdam, the salvage directors explain the planned operation to the representative of the West of England P&I Club. That most of the tanks in the engine room are severely damaged. The amount of buoyancy which we need to lift this aft part cannot be created in the tanks which are left in the double bottom, even if we should fill them all with polystyrene or air. And that's the reason why our technical department with Mr. Van Wij came up with this concept of four lifting barges, two hydraulic, two conventional ones with winches and tackles to raise this aft part of seven and a half thousand tons 
with a total lifting capacity of 11,000 tons. But as you know, the aft part sunk in the mud 15 meters up till here. For this reason, we have to dredge around the remaining aft part in order to get the wires underneath. Dredging continues for 30 days until 15,000 cubic meters of mud have been removed from around the wreck. At the same time, factories all over Western Europe are producing custom-designed equipment for the hoisting barges. Bow rollers, wires, sheaves, monkey faces, yokes, pulling shafts, winches, shackles, compensating wires. On such a scale as have never been used before on a salvage operation. All this equipment must be manufactured within four months. Hydraulic pulling machines of a unique design are also specially made for this final lift. Barge Giant 21, fitted with the hydraulic hoisting gear underway to Bantry. Ten kilometers of high-tension steel wires are made to order, varying in circumference from 44 up to 100 millimeters. This sling has a breaking strength of 630 tons. It is 140 meters long and weighs six and a half tons. On location, three sets of eight slings are pulled underneath the wreck and connected up again to the four lifting barges. The two conventional winch barges and the two hydraulic hoisting barges, total lifting capacity 11,000 tons safe working load, are anchored in position above the aft ship. One of the 24 slings which must pull the wreck to the surface is heaved in over the bow roller and secured to the pulling shaft. This shackle weighs more than 200 kilos. Not an easy job working with such giant gear.
With all the cables laid, the barges must be ballasted prior to hoisting. Steel plates are lowered into position between the wreck and the cables. When the barges start to pull, these plates will prevent the cables from biting into the weakened hull. Transducers are attached to the wreck to register all movement during the lifting. Zero hour. This is the climax of months of preparation. Everything is ready for the lift. The operation manager checks with each barge before the countdown. Jane, 21. Zijn 22 Dering en Jasmin Turtle. Zijn jullie klaar om te hijsen? Over. 21 is klaar. 22 klaar. Ja, de Jasmin klaar om te hijsen. Uh, oh, uh, Dering Turtle uh, klaar om te hijsen. Goed, dan. Vijf seconden na nu gaan we hijsen. 1, 2, 3, 4 en nu. Forty meters below, the wreck stirs in her muddy bed and then, very, very slowly, starts her upward journey. The shafts locked to the slings are drawn back by the specially designed pulling machines. Bogies on rails support the shaft's weight. There is no way back now. The four barges must hoist in synchronization to keep the wreck from sliding out of the slings. In the late morning of the first day, the aft part has raised clear of the sea bottom. This allows the barges, with the wreck suspended beneath, to move away from the jetty and take up an ideal position for the remainder of the operation. Central control monitors each barge. Wees één wat langzamer aan of twee harder. Kijk maar wat je doet. Both winch barges are equipped with five kilometers of steel wire. Any minute now. Zie je al 
The crewman reports the first sign of the wreck surfacing. The Daring Turtle, 2280 ton. Tasming Digital, 2290 and a quart of water on the board. Zijand 21, 980 ton. 280 bar, oplopend naar 300 bar is 1390 ton. 22, Digital, 1460 ton. Hydraulische druk, 280 bar, oplopend naar 285 is ongeveer 1225 ton. Hoisting continues steadily. A team of tugs tows the partially surfaced aft ship between the barges to a sheltered anchorage in the lee of Whitty Island. Cracks in the hull are patched so that the engine room can be pumped dry to create more buoyancy. Pumps are lowered inside the wreck. Slowly but surely, the combination of hoisting and pumping does the trick. This is the engine room.
The aft section has been raised high enough out of the water to be able to carry on with the final stage. The semi-submersible pontoon, Giant One, is again brought into position. The buoyancy chambers are flooded to sink her in 23 meters of water. With the two hydraulic lifting barges assisting to control stability, Giant One empties her tanks and slowly brings the aft section out, high and dry. It has taken more than a year and a half to raise the Betelgeuse. 573 days, non-stop, of skill, sweat, and guts for these men to accomplish the largest wreck removal of all time.